All right, let's get started. Hello, everyone. My name is Zoe Routh. I'm a leadership expert. I specialize in the people stuff, you know, the tough stuff and the fun stuff. You know how you stay up late worrying about those interactions that people have, that you have and they have with each other, that stuff that really eats away at you? Well, what I do is I show CEOs and their executives the skills and frameworks to unpack what's going on and get on with it. So you can build a fantastic team that you love to lead while delivering on a solid strategy. What we're covering today is Bad Apples. It's the first webinar in the series of Hot Potato. And uh, when I named this the Hot Potato series, I was thinking about Hot Potato, you know, like you're always juggling with these difficult issues. And my husband then went, haven't you heard the Wiggles sing Hot Potato? I'm like, what are you talking about? He goes, Hot Potato, Hot Potato, Cold Spaghetti, Cold Spaghetti. I'm like, what? <laughs> and when you're Canadian, you don't know all these childhood references. So I got educated on Hot Potato and had to watch the Wiggles sing the songs. <laughs> Some of you may already be familiar with the Hot Potato Wiggles song. That was my first introduction. Um, so is it, if this is the first time you are meeting me virtually and you haven't heard me speak before, I kind of alluded to it. My accent is Canadian. So I'm from the land of lakes and rivers and mounties and maple syrup. I'm from the land where our Canadian prime minister wears Star Wars socks. And what else? Where our national pride is defined by what we are not, as in we are not Americans. In terms of national pride, I think we need to work on something better than that. <laughs> but I've been in Australia since 1996, a good long time. I've become a citizen. Uh, even so, sometimes I come across things I don't know, like the hot potato thing, or I have expressions. I can't remember if they're Canadian or Australian. So if you need clarification on my language, just sing out. Um, I like to be interactive in my webinars because goodness knows we're all zoomed out. So we want to make this as engaging as possible. To do that, make sure you take notes, keeps your brain engaged, and it'll also help you recall the information better. Uh, the second thing is to use the chat box and make comments, ask questions as we go along to each other. Um, we will have polls and we will uh, do a little breakout room, hopefully, um, as we go along, depending how we're going for content-wise. Okay, so that's a little bit of an intro. I'm gonna get straight into some of, uh, some of the content for you. Let's get my slides up. All right, hot potato, troubleshoot prickly pandemic people stuff problems, said Peter Piper, the pickle paper piper. <laughs> uh, this is me airing my armpits on the top of uh, Mount Saunder on the Lara Pinta Trail. And uh, I put this slide in there because it, it's indicative of where I've come from. So I used to lead canoe trips in Canada. That was my first foray into work. And that brought me over here to Australia to work for Outward Bound, where I did outdoor leadership development. And then I worked for the Australian Rural Leadership Foundation. And I still include outdoor experiential education in some of my programs. And what I've discovered in all these different places and all these wild, wild depths of the country in different countries is that people dynamics are common and yet different. So the common things are the patterns I see people engaging with. The contexts are all really different. And the outdoors is where I've discovered a lot of these people patterns. And I've come to think of leadership as a wilderness. And we can learn how to read the map of the people dynamics. And that can help us lead us through this wilderness safely. These are some of the clients I've worked with. So you might be familiar with some of them. Um, they, are, they are huge, diverse lots, some in agriculture, some in uh, you know, in fitness and in online retail, uh, university sectors, government agencies, a lot of not-for-profits, whole swag of them. And even though each of their individual contexts is quite different, the themes of how organizations come to deal with their people challenges or not deal with them is the stuff that I'm interested in. So the co there's common problems in each context, even though the context, the difference between a university and a pork producer is quite significant. And yet uh, the challenges tend to be the same. And I got really interested in this uh, as, as, a, as a professional because I thought I was pretty good at, um, oh, hang on a second, stop share. No, there we go. Um, I thought I was pretty good at the people stuff, you know, as a, as a young leader leading canoe trips, I thought I had people dynamics down. I loved it. I was loved as a leader until it's always that moment of awareness. And the until moment was when I had a, a team that I was leading and I had somebody who didn't follow. 
<laughs> they challenged my leadership. They undermined my leadership. And it came into, it came to be quite a big stoush, if you like. And I lost. I lost a lot of my confidence as a result of that. I ended up resigning from the team. And I didn't know what happened. I didn't understand how this came to be. I didn't understand how this troublemaker could be so resistant and cause me so much trouble. And it really started me thinking about how do these things happen? How does leadership go well and then not? How do teams go well and then not? What are the dynamics that create that? And is there anything we can do as leaders to prevent these falling off a cliff into these disaster areas? And sometimes it's learning the hard way that we get to learn the best way. So I'm not sure I've learned the best way, but I've learned definitely better ways. And I wanna share with you through this series, what I think is useful in terms of unpacking dynamics and how to deal with them. All right. So bad apple, what is a bad apple? I'd love to hear what you, you think is a bad apple and just pop it into the chat box. What do you think makes a bad apple? And I know people are interested in this because um, it kind of strikes a chord. So what do you think makes a bad apple? Let's have a look. See what you put into the chat box. What makes a bad apple? Not engaged. Okay, so somebody who's along for the ride. Disengaged, yeah, non-team player, poor communication, not a team player. Misaligned views, people who are undermining, who lie, who have a large negative impact on team, but backstabber, oh, Dan. <laughs> yeah, those are pretty bad. Uh, bruised too often. <laughs> That's a really good insight. Thank you, Pia. Poor work ethic. Not sure there's a bad apple, but bad cultural fit. Interesting insight, Natalie. Uh, somebody who's negatively disruptive. Poor work ethics. Rotten at the core. Mmm, lovely. I <laughs> love how we're just working that metaphor. All right. So I tend to think of bad apples as somebody who's actively working against the culture. And um, it, can be, it can be quite challenging. And I think this language came out uh, over the whole George Floyd affair, if you remember, George Floyd was the Black American who was horribly um, set upon by a police officer in the U.S., and he was kneeled on for nine minutes and died. And it caused the uh, Black Lives Matter protests around the globe, which have been going on for, what, six months now. And there was conversation always, oh, that police officer was a bad apple. He, it was not indicative of the rest of the culture. And I think that's not the context in which we want to see this. A bad apple is not just a renegade, necessarily. Uh, so bad apple is disruptive behavior. And it could be any one of those bad behaviors that you've identified uh, in that. Thank you for the reference, Joner Nodar, Graham. I will look that up afterwards. Um, some of the behaviors we see with these bad apples or difficult behaviors, and some of them you've mentioned them, are things like back-channeling, uh, side quarter conversations, grumbling, white anting. Um, silos can be a problematic, apple, bad apple behavior. Defensiveness and aggressiveness and fighting. So we're going to unpack a lot of this as we go. But bad apples are the ones who are kind of putting on, a, they're getting under our skin, they're causing us distress. So we're going to look at some of the issues that contribute to that and what happens. So an interesting fact by the Society for Human Resources Management released a study in 2015 that calculated the cost of unhealthy workplace, workplaces at $223 billion, American workplaces, over five years. So unhealthy workplaces cost American workplaces in five years $223 billion in staff turnover. And I think all of us know that. You're all very successful, accomplished leaders. You know that a bad workplace can cause staff turnover and that costs extra expense. So a lot of the savvy leaders that I work with, like you, know that culture is critical to good strategy. And that if you don't get the culture right, it doesn't matter how good your strategy is. So a lot of the work that we do around this is how do we set up the culture and the systems for success. So I think what's important when we talk about these issues is to understand our current context. And there's a lot going on in the world, as you might have noticed. <laughs> and when we get familiar with what's going on, it sort of explains some of the dynamics. Big picture prior, besides pandemic, is we have the old world of work. It's all about hierarchy, line reporting, company paternalism. Uh, you have to be a company man. So 
like thinking about 30 to 50 years ago, right? The world of work was quite different. There was somebody, usually a man in charge, there was a line reporting, it was all hierarchical, it was all about the company looking after you and therefore your loyalty to the company was being company man and usually was a man. Loyalty was about loyalty to the company and, uh, and about sticking around and being part of that company. Once you got a job, you just stayed in that one place for a very long time until you got the gold watch and retired and the company paid your pension. You had to earn your stripes in this context. Now, the new world of work is quite different. The world has shifted significantly in the last 30 to 50 years. You know why. We've got internet connections that have unleashed so many different um, opportunities for us. We have globalism, we have interconnectivity, which is really amazing until it highlights our susceptibilities. Oh, and it was quite a stable work environment. Now, the new the world of work is less about hierarchy and more about holacracy. Holacracy in workplaces now is about independent work teams having a fair amount of autonomy to make decisions for themselves in the greater picture of the organization. It's a very different structure around decision making. We have project reporting instead of line reporting. So it's because of the, the nature of the work is less stable and linear, it's more volatile and complex. We have a lot more self-reliance. So staff members coming into organizations today have a stronger sense of autonomy and self-responsibility. And they're more interested in purpose. And so workers today are really purpose people as opposed to a company man. And I think that's a really important distinction that organizations and leaders need to contend with. You know, what is our purpose? Does it resonate? Uh, does it attract the people that we want to work with us? And is there an alignment there? Some of you spoke to that misalignment of values and cultural fit is a big problem. It contributes to bad apples. Um, we have this wanting to make a contribution. So it's less about loyalty to the organization over a period of years and wanting to make a contribution within the context of that workplace. We need to show our stripes instead of earn our stripes. So a lot of Gen Ys and Gen Zs have had a very different education than I had. Uh, so as a Gen Xer, where um, we didn't have the internet in high school. <laughs> so you learned a really different way. And the way that pe young people are learning is quite exponential because of the technology access. They can get access to information and resources and backgrounds and histories like that. Whereas in the old days, you have to go to the library, you have to do a bloody search and all these books and read up on it. It was very time consuming to get knowledge, let alone wisdom and application. So young people have a huge different expectation about um, the world of work. And they definitely feel like they need to be acknowledged on merit as opposed to on longevity in the place. And it's volatile. We know that like this year more than anything else has highlighted how different this is. So we have new staff members who have this paradigm of the new world of work and we have an old way of working in the organization. It's going to cause stress and angst. It's going to cause conflict and some bad apples can result from that different expectations to the work environment. Now, I'm not sure where each of you sit, where your organizations, if they're more in the old world of work or whether they're oriented to the new world of work. And I think this is an interesting thing to have a think about. When you think about your bad apples, is it because there's a misaligned expectation of new world of work versus old world of work? This is an interesting concept as well. Like in the new world of work, crowdocracy is something that many organizations are moving to. This is slightly different to democracy where everybody has a vote on something, which not many organizations do. And yet with leadership of crowdocracy, this is where every individual in the organization can contribute to solution making. Sounds like a decision making nightmare <laughs> because like if everybody has a voice in a big issue, how do you get things resolved? There is a process that you can apply so that this actually happens and it creates better buy-in. And I would point you to, ooh, I've forgotten his name, a gentleman who's I interviewed and whose name has just gone out of my brain. His resources, if you just look up Crowdocracy, his book is on that. And it outlines this whole process of how you can get people involved in decision-making and it creates much, much better buy-in. So what is a bad apple? It's somebody who causes problems. And I think the other thing we need to be mindful of is like, is it a good kind of troublemaker or a bad kind of troublemaker? A good kind of troublemaker is somebody who challenges the status quo, somebody who says, hang on a minute, what if? That's very different to somebody who's whinging and backbiting and undermining and uh, having turf wars and, and, and silos and is emotive and distressing to be around. That's different. 
So a troublemaker who's it was a bit of a devil's advocate can be actually really healthy for the organization. So we need to be mindful of that, that we don't just pe label people bad apples because of their challenging attitude. Sometimes that challenging attitude is, is really, really useful. So a couple of trends. Retaliation in the workplace. Oh, this is one of the reasons why people find it difficult to speak up and can cause bad apple kind of behavior is that with the movement of things like the Me Too movement and Time's Up and even Black Lives Matter, there has been real retaliation for people raising these issues in the workplace. Uh, they can be ostracized, isolated, they could be stood down, they could be marginalized, they can lose their jobs. And so this is a real problem if we're trying to get to the bottom of an issue and the bad apple is grumbling in the background and doesn't feel safe to actually air their grievances. So retaliation in the workplace is kind of this big backdrop that we've got around what's happening for people. Um, should they say something or not? Sometimes it's easier just to have a whinge uh, to your friends and to operate behind the scenes to try and make a change or at least have a grumble about it. So this is a contributing factor to bad appleness. Another one is bias. Um, there are thousands of different biases we have in the workplace. And some of the ones we've been noticing have come up in the four um, that is problematic and gets in the way of people of leaders engaging their teams better is things like confirmation bias. We get an idea about a person or a situation, and then we look for evidence to back that up. You know, so we think, oh, Joe, Joe is such a troublemaker, or Joe is just a negative ninny. And then all of a sudden we find ourselves subconsciously looking for examples of that to reinforce that belief. We all fall prey to this because it feels good to have our beliefs affirmed. And so we might have confirmation bias that is dismissing people uh, because of this pattern that we've, we, we're seeking out and trying to reinforce in our own belief about it. Um, so that's a problem. Another one is affinity bias, which is where we resonate with people who are like us. And as leaders, we, this is so dangerous, right? So we may label somebody bad apple because they are not like us and um, they behave in ways that isn't how we would behave. And so we reject them. And then we start to lean towards the people who do behave like us. So it's a pretty troublesome one. Again, it's all subconscious until we put a flashlight on it and have a really have a look at it. So some of these things create bad apples as well. So it further isolates and ostracizes people because they're not like us, the leader. Um, affinity confirmation. So those are the two main ones. Confirmation and bias and, aff and affirmation bias can be difficult ones that create bad apple conditions. So yeah, it's not just about the individual, it's what creates them. And this is the other trend that we've noticed is that recognition is actually a key driver of people's engagement. Uh, Dan Pink wrote a book called Drive and in it he listed three things that he thought contributed to engagement at work. One was purpose, another was mastery, so mastery of a skill, and the third one was autonomy, the ability to make decisions for yourself. OC Tanner did some work in 2016 and they added to that and what they found in their research when they asked people what makes a great place well, what makes work great was the question. And overwhelmingly, the standout response was recognition. Now, if we're not giving people enough recognition, then disengagement happens. There's a lot of depressing, depressing? Mm, yeah, that's not quite the word, right word. Um, disengagement and bad appleness can emerge as a result of that. So, so some of the, these are some of the trends we're seeing in workplaces, good and bad, um, whether or not we're responding to them effectively or not. It can create conditions for bad apples. Some myths, bad apples are bad people. Now, many of you are very experienced leaders and you know this is not the case necessarily. It, this is not about personalities often. Um, so bad apples, their behavior is bad. The people aren't bad. And they have bad behavior because often they're people under threat. They have a sense of survival um, that's going on for them. And we're gonna unpack a little bit of, of this as we go through the series. So bad apples aren't bad people. Bad apples have bad behavior. This is a big one. Bad apples are psychopaths. Um, we tend, sometimes we can say thinking that bad apples have a psychological challenge. That's not necessarily the case. Psychopath is actually a very big word with big connotations. Psychopath is somebody who has a brain dysfunction, who cannot experience empathy and does not care about others and can often be violent towards others. These are like a rare uh, rare thing to find in the workplace and it has a different 
we need to treat that very differently than this general malaise, which is what bad appleness is really about. Um, so psychopaths are an unusual special case consideration. And there's been a lot of conversations with the advent of Trump, of discussions around narcissism. Narcissism, narcissism. Oh my goodness, I can't even pronounce that properly. <laughs> Narcissists, there we go, got it out. So a narcissist is somebody who's very self-obsessed and they will put themselves first above others. And this is definitely bad Apple behavior um, where they don't really care about the emotions of other people. They can understand um, the emotions of other people, but they can manipulate that sometimes. They can be manipulative to get around it, to get what they want. This is a socialized or conditioned experience, which is different to a psychopath, which is an actual brain dysfunction. Narcissists often come from really poor childhood experiences. And interestingly enough, they can be extremely high performance in an organization. And when you put them in the positions of leadership, that's when all hell breaks loose. Because yes, somebody who's just looking out for number one, they're going to run ramshaw over their teams and other teams and create chaos. However, you can have a narcissist performing well in an individual lone wolf kind of way doesn't always suit the culture though. So I think we need to be mindful of that. The other one is that bad apples are poisonous. And there's a reason for that expression, bad apples rock the bunch. So their behavior is problematic. Um, they're a bummer and they can bring the mood down. What we find though is how are they poisonous? Like, are they trying to make other people into jerks? Not necessarily. But what bad apples are doing is they're looking for confirmation. They're using confirmation bias to seek out like-minded people who have an ax to grind or a grudge to bear. And this is where it becomes problematic is that they will drag other people into their pity party. Uh, that's where the poisonous aspect comes from, but not necessarily they want to sabotage the organization explicitly. Often they want to be part of the organization, but they've got issues with one aspect of it. Okay. So that's what we need to be mindful of is how we define and think about bad apples. So this is what I think. A couple things going on here is that it's process, not personalities. That's really behind a lot of this behavior. And, and in fact, what I found in my research and my experience is that it's often the systems that we have in place that create the conditions for bad behavior to arise. So if we just look at personalities, it's a surface thing. And in fact, if we default to saying, oh, you know, that's just Joe, he's just a jerk, it's defeatist. And it's, it means that we can't find a great solution to that problem because we're laying all the problem on Joe. And I think this is not what we want to do. We actually want to have a look in the mirror, the organizational mirror about what our processes are. And we're going to have a look through the series at some of these processes. This is a really big one. And I'm going to be repeating this throughout the series is when you know the patterns, you can manage the people. So a lot of the work I do is showing leaders, here is a map of some of the behaviors we might be seeing. And these are some of the tweaks that you can make within that system to direct better outcomes. So when you have a map of human behavior, it helps us to make better and positive interventions long-term. This is really, really critical. And the third one is dive, don't surf. What I mean by that is that we need to go well below the surface layer of the problems into what's really driving, uh, driving the activity. Okay, so deep dive, don't keep it superficial. <clears throat> now, how do people respond to bad apples? <laughs> and, you know, there's some good ways and there's some bad ways. So let's talk about some of the experiences we might have had. Um, some leaders let it go on too long. And when I talk to leaders about how do you deal with this disruptive behavior, um, how have you responded? And uh, many of them, admit, I just let it go on too long because it's hard to deal with, right? Dealing with negative behavior, negative attitude is, is tricky. And so sometimes we just let it go on too long. Um, some leaders confess that they use placating to try and get rid of the bad behavior. So it's like the greasy wheel, um, the squeaky wheel gets greased. <laughs> I think that's, it's sort of expression. So sometimes leaders will go into placating. It's like, if I just give them this, maybe they'll be quiet. Uh, the third one is, I've seen leaders do this, is rather than addressing specifically the issue with the individual, they raise it in a group setting, you know? And so they bring the team together and go, what I've been hearing is that there's issues around, you know, 
people complaining about blah or people having issues about blah. So people is the leader's way of skipping out on addressing the directly with the individual. And what happens generally is that people who aren't bad apples in the group think that they're being accused of something and they feel bad and all of a sudden it goes all to hell in a handbasket. So that's not often very good. Uh, the fourth way is just to ignore it. It's like, oh, I can't believe this. Why can't they just get on and do their job? And the fifth way is just to dive in and deal with it direct. So I'm going to share a poll with you guys, and I'd love for you to vote on how you've dealt with it. Um, so this is, you can pick as many as, as are suitable for you. Have a crack at that. How have you dealt with bad apples in the past? Have you done let it go on too long? Have you played it? You might've done all of these, <laughs> but it'd be interesting to see how people have dealt with this particular situations and what the conditions are there. Obviously, you know, dealing with it straight up is the, is the best response. And it's not always our first response. Okay. All right, another five or so seconds, give you all a chance to vote. Okay. And we are closing the poll. And let's see. Okay. Awesome. Look at that. You might have dealt with it badly the first time, but many of you say just deal with it straight up. <laughs> Yeah, that's the best way to go. Um, interestingly, after that, in terms of things, letting go on too long, yeah, yep. So very few people have dealt with, um, you know, trying placating or raising it in the group and having it backfire. Yeah, that's the worst one, I think. Um, I'd love to hear what other is. <laughs> if anybody clicked other and you'd like to share, that would be awesome. Just unmute yourself and let me know. Go ahead, Graham. Hi, is that, um in a couple of cases, through um, a mentoring, through actually sort of taking a, a, a different approach where you can see that the person's capacity is there and you, with, with their permission or not, is to just try and mentor them and show them um, what their behavior is like if, if you can sense that, they, that they're open to it. And on both instances that I can recall, it's worked. Yeah, fantastic. So yeah, to taking a mentoring slash coaching approach to yep. help them open up to new ways of being and saying, lovely, thank you. Now, was there somebody else who'd like to share that clicked other? Just wondering if they're still here because a couple of people had to duck away. Okay, I'm not seeing that. All right, well, thank you everybody for that. Fantastic. Okay. So we're going to move into solutions. Yay. <laughs> it's one thing to whinge about what's going on. It's another thing to get to solutions. So let's get into solutions. Where are we here? Here we go. And uh, we're going to share my, my, one of my favorite models. And one of the solutions is to be a biochemical drug dealer. <laughs> I just think it's funny to have a, being a drug dealer as part of your leadership solutions. So let's unpack what this actually means. As leaders, we're always balancing between task and team. And that's a constant, a constant dynamic, right? So we've got to get the job done and we have to look after the people and the dynamics. So there's a constant tension there. There's also a tension between quality. So quality time with the team and quality of the task versus energy of, uh, of time and ta of task and team. What's interesting is that we can, we can manage biochemicals uh, in a positive way to create positive outcomes if we do specific things. So essentially when we, when we focus on generating sp specific positive biochemicals, we can have a really positive team effect. So this is a preventative measure for bad apples. The first one is having a focus on a task with high energy. This creates endorphins and endorphins are like a natural painkiller, which comes after effort. And the way that we can do that as leaders is having something that the group and individuals can strive towards. It's measurable, measurable it's actionable, uh, something that stretches them. So when we have that in place, we, have, we create the conditions where people can search and achieve, and it creates a sense of accomplishment. So endorphins are related to accomplishment, achievement, and being able to hit targets. 
dopamine is a little bit different. Uh, dopamine is the biochemical that comes from when we find something, when we complete something, we get the little surge of yes. It's a little bit different to endorphins, which is a bit of a bigger rush. And dopamine is like a little bit of a hook. And you might've heard a lot about dopamine when it comes to addictive technologies, because that's what they're designed to do. They're designed to hook your dopamine system. So things like emails, so that little notification, which is up in the court, corner of your screen, that says, ooh, you have seven new emails. That's the anticipation of something new in there. And your dopamine system gets hooked. So you go into your email and you go, wow, what's here for me today? Like, what's in the email lottery today? <laughs> and all of a sudden you're, you're scrolling, you're clicking, and, and you're getting these little dopamine surges. That's why email is so addictive. And as leaders, we spend far too much time on email. It feels like you're being productive cleaning out your inbox. And you know, it's not, there's something, so many better things you could be doing with it. It's also the feeling of like, um, if you've ever drafted a to-do list, gone away and done your task for the day, look at your to-do list at the end of the day and realize you did something, but it wasn't on your to-do list. You were actually write it in your to-do list just so you can cross it off. Mm -hmm. That's dopamine. <laughs> so that sense of accomplishment, it's a really good feeling. Uh, so as leaders, we, we can set this up in our work structures by creating a sense of progress and making progress visible for us. So the reason we think dope, reason we think email is accomplishing things. So as we see our list diminish in size, yes, we get the sense of satisfaction, but there's other things we can do as leaders to make progress more visible. And it's things like having a Gantt chart. So we can see, for example, progress through projects. We can tick off major milestones. We can have a thermometer if there's an accumulation type of activity where there's a sales activity, you know, we're like 20% towards our target for the month or um, anything where we can rally around accomplishment. Kanban boards are, are like that as well, where you have, you know, these are our projects started and completed and you move post-it notes across these three columns. That is a way of encouraging dopamine and positive attraction to continuing the effort. So as leaders, we can create systems that leverage these biochemicals. Now, when it comes to these task type of activities, they feel good and they are draining. So they deplete the immune system and they need to be rebooted. So dopamine and endorphins are quite taxing on the body if they're in constant demand. So constant focus on task is quite draining. So what we need to do is help reboot the system and re reboot it by focusing on the right-hand side of this drug dealing biochemical wheel. Ha ha. And the first way we reboot is with serotonin. And the serotonin kind of activities we can have as leaders, <laughs> excuse me, are things like recognition. Recognition and acknowledgement and celebration is all in the serotonin wheelhouse. And when we see somebody recognize, it doesn't even have to be us. When we witness somebody else being recognized and celebrated, that gives us a feel good sense of well being. And serotonin is the well being biochemical, it's a self esteem biochemical. So, as leaders, when we have recognition practices and celebration practices, we are totally tapping into the serotonin systems for our team. So, it's really, really important we have these kind of rituals in place when we manage our teams. Um, <clears throat> then, the last one is oxytocin. And oxytocin is the love drug. It's the trust drug. It, it, that's what exists and comes to the fore in well-bonded teams uh, between parents and children. It happens when we give 20-second hugs, when we are able to give hugs <laughs> to people. <laughs> it actually happens with a simple touch. Like we, even an elbow touch helps to generate a bit of oxytocin. And what do you do when you're through the screens all the time like this? Apparently this, putting your hands on your, over your heart when you're talking through the screens can actually trigger an oxytocin feeling as well. So as I'm talking to you, I'm sending you all so much love and this is giving me a nice feel good buzz. <laughs> and if you do it, if you do it back, that'd be even more awesome. Yeah, go for it. I can see you guys on the screen. <laughs> if you do this, you can give me a little buzz and yourself a little buzz of oxytocin. Um, so gratitude exists here as well. So these practices, how do you build that into your team is the critical thing. And I've got a whole checklist that we're gonna go through and see how you do. This is where bad apples can emerge. If we don't have enough oxytocin and people don't feel safe to speak up, this is where bad apples can emerge. 
So anything we can do to build safety in a team and trust in the team is going to help be preventative when it comes to bad apples. Okay. Right. So wasn't this cool? Like, I just love this model. <laughs> so if you can become a biochemical drug dealer by using the systems and practices in the work, you can become much better at preventing bad apple behavior. Now, when it comes to biochemicals, we need to also detox from the hard stuff, the hard drugs. And these are the hard drugs. They are adrenaline and cortisol. That's high stress environments. And what happens when there's particular things that happen in the workplace that can trigger cortisol and adrenaline and, and activate the amygdala, which is our fight and flight response, the little almond shaped organ in the back of our brainstem that goes whoop, high alert, we're in survival mode. And these are the triggers for that. Fear of loss is the overarching category. Anytime we fear we are going to lose something, we have an amygdala rea reaction. And when that happens, amygdala fires up, sends cortisol and adrenaline through the body, and we get tunnel vision. We get narrow focus on survival mode, which means we, are, we lose access to our frontal lobe, which is where our neocortex rationalization happens. We find it difficult to learn. We find it difficult to engage. We can be emotionally reactive, and we, can, we, have, we lose access to our short-term memory as well. So it's really quite a dysfunctional state. So bad apple behavior is often related to this. These are some of the triggers. And as I go through them, I want you to take note of which ones might be the triggers for you. Loss of power and autonomy. Well, you only need the pandemic to say, hang on a minute, we all lost power and autonomy. And particularly our friends in Victoria who had second lockdown imposed upon them. Why do you think people are pretty grumpy about that? Grumpy is a mild word. Um, distressed by that is because they lost their sense of power and autonomy in their own world. You can't go out past, what is it, nine o'clock now. You have to stay restricted in your home. It's quite harsh. And this, so this puts people into an amygdala hijack, an unhelpful kind of state of being. This, all this uncertainty uh, in the pandemic causes some of this distressed behavior. The second one is loss of position and status. So if you have a change program and you change people's titles, even though they don't get paid any less, this can cause unhelpful behaviors in people. So because people get attached to status symbols, you don't think they do because it sounds egotistical, but status is really important survival mechanism for us. It's how we know where we fit in the tribe. And if that gets threatened somehow, then we can go into amygdala hijack, unhelpful behaviors, bad apple land. Um, so this is another trigger. By the way, these are all have been mapped by David Rock, who's an Australian neuroscientist and his work. Uh, so what I've done is had a look at his work and the triggers and mapped it against the biochemicals also in terms of how we can best address them. The third one is loss of place and belonging. And this is the oxytocin piece, right? So when people feel like they're not included, uh, they don't have a sense of trust and safety in the group, then they could go into the survival mechanism, which triggers this bad apple behavior. The fourth trigger is loss of performance. So during the pandemic, a whole bunch more extra work landed on people's plates. How do we respond to this pandemic? What are our new protocols and practices? What decisions do we need to make? Uh, also, a lot of people, organizations laid off staff, which meant more work for the remaining staff. And then there was the survival, will I be next kind of thing. All of this contributes to pandemic issues. And it's all quite bloody exhausting <laughs> for leaders and for the teams. So a lot of the conversations I've had with, with teams now is that most of the crisis, is, we've moved through it. And it's more like, how do we keep navigating this level of uncertainty? And people are exhausted and drained from it and kind of want it to end, but there is no end in sight. And that's part of the problem. Okay, so I'm going to pause and send you off into chat boxes um, for a, so you can meet and greet each other and also talk about where, what are you seeing? What are the triggers you're seeing in your teams? Are any of these at play? You know, and what kind of behaviors are you experiencing? Um, so stop share. So I'm going to put you into groups so you can meet each other. So you're going to be talking about what are the triggers that you see and what are the kind of behaviors that you've been dealing with. And we'll just start there <laughs> rather than solutions, because I'm only going to give you five minutes to do that. Okay. So the, the conversations are, 
what are you seeing in terms of behaviors? And what are the triggers are you seeing as part of that? I can't see what I'm doing here. Two to three participants per room. Okay, whoops. I'm gonna put you into, it should be one to two. Um, in your breakout rooms, you have to click accept. And I'm gonna move Jeffrey, I'm gonna to have to put you uh, in a different room. Here we go. Open all rooms, here we go. Let's see if I got this sorted out okay. Yeah. Cool. Press pause. Recording. And we are, um, what we're going to do next, uh, actually it would be really cool to, to hear if there's anything that you'd like to share with the group. Uh, pop it into the chat box in terms of what came out of your conversation in terms of patterns that you're seeing. So feel free to pop that into the chat box. Um, what we're going to go through now is a little bit of a checklist and see how you're going. And I was looking at the checklist. I'm going to read it through with you. So it's a little bit of an audit. Uh, to see how you go with this. And the checklist is seven habits for boosting, boosting oxytocin and trust. Now, I know many of you, and I know many of you are very experienced leaders. And so I reckon this is going to be pretty good. You guys are going to ace it. But listen for the, for the habits um, that you don't have yet in place that would up-level what you're already doing. Because uh, I know many of you are already very, very capable with this. Okay, so... This is the seven habits for boosting oxytocin and trust. So what I want you to do is I'm going to read out each one and you have to listen to the entire description before you give yourself credit for being, having this habit in place. The first one is feedback. I focus on, catch, on catching people doing something right. I track each person's behavior weekly so I can compliment them and let them know, hang on a second. I didn't share the screen, did I? <laughs> I knew there was something missing. All right, hang on. Let's go. Try it. Start over. There we go. Feedback. I catch people doing something right. Uh, I track each person's behavior weekly so I can compliment them and let them know they're doing great work and they feel appreciated. I discuss positive and negative results and behavior with each team member at least monthly. Any conversations that need to be had happen as soon as possible and are reviewed at least monthly. So, if you aced all that, give yourself a point. Ta-da. Next one, check-ins. We start all meetings with check-ins. We Each person is called upon to share not only what they are focusing on, but how they are feeling. And uh, that uh, that's sometimes difficult depending on the workplace culture and environment. And yet, it makes such a big difference. Uh, we call each other out on misaligned behavior. Our frank conversations and differences make our team stronger, not weaker. I discuss positive and negative team behaviors at least monthly. If you aced all that, give yourself a point. Three, one-on-ones. I meet with each di direct report once per week. I know each, depend it depends how many direct reports you have, of course. If you have 20, which is a bad number to have as direct report, this can be challenging. Uh, I know each staff member's personal family circumstances. I know each individual's personal work preferences, how, i.e. how they like to work. Uh, I let each person know they are valued and appreciated and liked. That's you. Give yourself a tick. All right, number four, recognition. I know how each person likes to be recognized publicly or privately. I make an effort to recognize each person in their preferred manner at least once per month. I recognize team effort and outcomes to the group and the broader organization on major milestones at least quarterly. So that's the celebration piece. Oops. That's the recognition piece. Celebration is the next one. We celebrate personal and professional achievements sincerely for each team member. Sincerely is the operative word there. We know each team member's birthday, start date, promotion date. 
We know each time teach teach. Eh. We know each team member's core family members names. We know each team member's hobbies and sports. We have a list of each team member's hot beverage preference so we can buy them a thank you coffee. I like dandelion tea with a splash of almond milk. Just FYI. <laughs> we have a list of each member, team member's wish list so we can give meaningful gift for major milestones. Okay, that's you. Give yourself a tick there. Number six, mistakes. I own up to mistakes that I make to the team. I explain how the mistake occurred and what I learned from it. All team members are encouraged to share their mistakes and insights. We make a list of mistakes and lessons each month and review them the following month. Pretty tough little checklist. Number seven, fun. I have fun with the team. Side note, I once had, was part of an organization team where we had a discussion about core values and I raised the fact that team was an important thing, or fun was an important aspect to have the team. And two people said, no, I disagree. I don't think fun is important. So that was really challenging for my values. And while well, I didn't last too long on that team, I have to say. Anyway, back to the checklist. Um, I encourage good natured humor, not sarcasm. Sarcasm has a barb to it. We need to be really careful with that. Between team members and at meetings. We undertake a social activity at least once per, ma month, per month, like afternoon drinks, a team lunch, or a trivia challenge at a team meeting. This is not mandated fun that you have to attend. It's something social you do within work hours to to show appreciation and fun with each other. We have fun even when under pressure, we can make each other laugh. That's really important. That's number seven. Okay, so I would like to know how many you got out of seven in the chat box. So if you got seven out of seven, put seven. If you got three out of seven, put, put that number in, into the chat box. And we'll just have a look, see how people do. I reckon there's gonna be high number of high scores in this group. Yeah, Lisa, six, Graham, six, Jessica, four, Nick, five, two, Susan, two. The best thing about lower numbers is how much of a difference doing some of this stuff will make in terms of building engagement and support in the team. Yeah, cool. About a six. Yeah, cool. Look at that. Fantastic. I will include the full checklist in the follow-up notes. So you can have access to that. You can share it with your team. You can do whatever you like with it. So you can have the detailed analysis with that. Fantastic. So this applies to everybody. Whatever parts you don't have, imagine if you did implement that, what kind of difference it would make to that sense of co cohesion and inclusion in your team. And that goes a long way to preventing some of these negative behaviors that we experience uh, down the track. So there's a couple of things I want to cover off in terms of what you can do right now uh, following this immediately after the podcast <laughs> at 5 p.m. on a Monday. No, just kidding. Three steps to take right now. If you know the patterns, you can manage the people. So one of the things you can do is boost oxytocin with one of the habits. So have a look at that checklist and go, right, I'm going to focus on, let's say it's celebration. I'm going to put some aspect of celebration into our rituals as a team. Have a look underneath the surface and explore which loss trigger is driving some of the problematic behavior that you might be experiencing or dealing with. Diffuse the trigger by adjusting your systems. So we're gonna unpack this a little bit more in, in the next session around sour grapes. When we look at the four devils of people stuff and we look at some of the systems that contribute to this negative behavior. So you can play around with some of this though. Pick with one habit, have a go at implementing that. Now, there are some mistakes that I see people make when they go to do this kind of work. First one, and it's this, that we label people and not their behaviors. And uh, so we think people are bad apples, but not, but what we really need to do is label the behavior as bad apple-ish, which is awkward language. This is a really key distinction because often what drives people is the systems, the processes, not their personality. The other thing I see is that leaders don't manage biochemicals effectively. You really need a balance of all those biochemicals around the wheel, uh, not just the task oriented ones. And this is often the default I see is that a lot of leaders are good at the task side of things, not necessarily always good at the team side of things. They need a balance of both. It's not one or the other, it's both. We assume that we don't get triggered ourselves. All of us are biochemical bags of soup. <laughs> And so we will get triggered. We will have the same similar loss triggers uh, happening for us. 
And when we put the mirror up, it's important to know where ours might get triggered in conversations, in situations. And I've seen this with how leaders are responding in the pandemic. Some have been hit harder than others because they have sensitivities around uh, uncertainty or loss of position or status or whatever, or fairness or whatever it is for them. So we all, that, we all have that going on for us. And as soon as we become more aware of it, it starts to diffuse it for us. We don't get as triggered when we know what those triggers are. This is, this is a massive mistake is that people don't look below the surface to see what the structures they have in place and how that might be creating difficult behaviors. Uh, we're definitely going to talk about examples of this next week in Sour Grapes um, because the four critical systems that we have that if we're not dealing with properly cause problems are promotions, uh, recognition, um, delegation, and what's the fourth one? <laughs> Recognition, promotion, oh, remuneration, how we get paid. Those are the four, four systems. If we don't have those transparent and well thought out, it can cause all sorts of four devilish type of problems and bad apple behavior. The other big thing is that leaders don't spend enough time developing their own emotional intelligence. We need lots of advanced emotional intelligence techniques to stay centered and calm and composed so that we can access different neurological states like the flow state. So we can be better, uh, better creative, but more inspiring, more inspired and uh, more intuitive. So these are all the big mistakes I see that people make when it comes to this work. I love this quote from Marcel Proust and it's at the beginning of my new book, People Stuff. Um, the real voyage of discovery consists not in seeking new lands, but in having new eyes. And in the work that we're going to do over, this, over the course of this series is helping you have new eyes to look at different patterns when it comes to people dynamics. You haven't got a copy of the book? Get a copy of the book. It's really good. <laughs> Can I say that? <laughs> it's a gratuitous self-promotion. It's really helpful. Um, I wrote this book because I really wanted to help give different lenses for people uh, to look at these people dynamics. Okay, so we're, oh, look at that, exactly on the dot. That's so good. Um, so thank you everybody for participating. I can hang around a little bit if people wanna have individual chats and wanna clarify anything. Uh, if you, before you shoot off, I'd love if you just dropped into the chat box what was most useful for you and what was a key insight, that would be fantastic. Um, we will send the recording out after this with, along with the checklist and we will be catching up next Monday, same time for sour grapes. So I'll officially sign off. Those who want to stay for a chat, be great. Before you sign off, pop into the chat box what you got out of it. That'd be fabulous. All right, so stop recording.